So, um, any who's who's got a question about something? Anything? Yeah. I'll start since you mentioned you ended with Nick Gray. Can I talk about um, I want to talk just briefly. Maybe you can just say a few words about uh, another great guitarist I know you had an opportunity to work with around that time, and it uh, should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about uh, Richard and, and Fairport and how that that sort of the genesis of that of that strange folk rock. Phenomenon, the you know the trap type thing. Richard Thompson and Fairport Convention and Legion Leaf and the English folk rock revolution. Um, well, I heard I was running this club called UFO, which was the sort of psychedelic ballroom of London in 1967. And I heard Fairport Convention audition for a spot at UFO. And I, I didn't quite know what to make of them, because on the one hand, I, I liked them. There's something about them that I liked a lot. But on the other hand, they were playing all these terrible American singer-songwriter songs, like Eric An like Thirsty Boots by Eric Anderson, a song that I'd always hated. And, um, <laughs> a lot of people like that song, but I never did. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Eric Anderson always used to annoy me, but um, um, it's probably because I was just because I was in love with De secretly in love with Debbie Green. And was just jealous. But um, uh, there was something anyway. They they were I thought they were pretty good, and they. they their attitude, their approach was interesting to hear this all this American stuff sort of filtered back at me through this English sensibility. And so I booked them for a spot at UFO. And about halfway through the set, they announced that they were going to do East West, which was this track that the Paul Butterfield band had done, an extended track on the second Butterfield album. I think it was the title of the album. It was a kind of show-off piece for Mike Bloomfield's guitar playing. And Bloomfield was, I mean, he was reckoned to be one of the ace guitar players at the time. I mean, he was the, the hot guitar hero for America, you know, sort of the equivalent of Clapton, I guess, in England. Maybe not quite to that extent, but they announced this, and I went, oh, no, no, please. <laughs> what, what a bad idea this is, you know. And... And then Richard just start, started playing guitar, and he completely cut Bloomfield to pieces. And he was only 17. And, and I just, you know, at the end of that set, I, you know, it was like some sort of cartoon, you know, corny cartoon scene. I rushed into the dressing room and said, here, sign this contract. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, and started working with them. And, and, um, you know, in the book I talk about how Sandy Denny, I met Sandy Denny and, you know, thought she was really wonderful, but I couldn't quite see her getting along with the Fairport as part of the group, and they already had a girl singer. And then they got rid of their girl singer and brought Sandy into the group without my having anything to do with it. And, um, and the group, for me, I think the greatest Fairport Convention record is the third record on Half Bricking. Um, in which they sort of started to balance everything. It's Richard was writing songs, Sandy was writing songs, they were doing some Dylan songs. They did. But they also did uh, some really unusual things on that record, and they did them brilliantly. Uh, one was to take a Dylan song and translate it into French and play it as if it was a Cajun song. And that became uh, a hit. <clears throat> and, um, and the other thing they did was to take this traditional folk song called A Sailor's Life, which Sandy, you know, Sandy, her ambition was to be in, you know, in a, in, a, in a rock group and write songs, but she loved, she'd come from the folk scene and she loved singing traditional ballads and she used to sing them on in the bus, you know, in the, in the van, going to gigs and in dressing rooms and just hanging around. She sort of, because these guys were typical English middle class boys 
who thought folk music was something American. They had no idea about, or they had a very bad idea about their own folk music. They just thought it was Ewan McCall with a finger in his ear or, um, you know, a class of school eight-year-olds being forced to dance around a maypole to, in an English country garden or something like that. And so they, ha they didn't really know much about their own traditions and Sandy whetted their interest in this and then they loved his song, Sailor's Life, and we recorded it with Dave Swarbrick on, on violin as a kind of guest artist. And it was done as this extended improvisation around the traditional tune. And it was fantastic. I mean, I loved it. it was, but it was part of this whole new maturity of the group. It was just going to be, the, they were diversifying. It was all theirs. And I was in America organizing their first big American tour. And they, I got them invited to the Newport Folk Festival uh, in... Um, this would have been, that was going to be the summer of 69, and <clears throat> it was all going to be great. And then in the middle of that, in, while I was in America, they, their road manager fell asleep at the wheel, the van spun out of control off the motorway. Richard Thompson's girlfriend, American girlfriend, was killed, and Martin Lamble, the drummer, was killed. And their first thought was that that was the end of the group. They would never play again. And as they recovered from their injuries and they began thinking about it, they, they, um, they began exploring, talking together about the possibility of reforming and carrying on. But they agreed immediately the one thing that was absolutely impossible was they could never play any of those songs again the songs that they'd worked out with Martin. They just, that was off the board. So it was going to have to be a new repertoire, complete start from scratch, new repertoire. And one of the big cultural events in, in the world of musicians in England that year was the release of Music from Big Pink by the band. And that record hit like a ton of bricks. I mean, it was just an immensely important record. Every musician I ran into that spring, you know, had a copy under his arm, you know, just bought it or he was taking it over someplace to listen to or he was talking about it. And, and that record had a huge effect on the Fairport because when they listened to it, they realized, in a way, I think they saw their own versions of Dylan songs, their versions of Americana, as being lightweight and naive. And because the band just sort of laid down a marker, you know, you want to play American music, you know, play something as American as this, you know, I dare you. It was just not possible. And, and so th that whole area of repertoire was sort of shut. That door was just slammed shut by the band. They couldn't go there. But, on the other hand, it opened up a new possibility. What if they came up with a record and a repertoire that was as English as Big Pink was American? So they invited Dave Swarbrick to join the group. And they found a new drummer called Dave Mattax, who came from dance bands, you know, playing for tea dances and sort of like Lester Lannan orchestra type of bands, you know, sort of for deb debutante balls and he'd done a lot of dance, playing for dances. And he was the perfect drummer to invent a way to play English jigs and reels and traditional music in a rock setting. And with Swarbrick and Sandy leading the way, they spent, we, I rented them a, a farmhouse in, <clears throat> near Winchester and um, they spent two months there just working out this whole repertoire that then became Legion Leaf, and uh, which just this year was voted the, uh, or last year or whatever, it was uh, voted the most influential folk record in history in Britain by BBC Radio 2 listeners or something like that. So that's, 
that's kind of the story. And 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 you know, Richard. The thing about the interesting thing about Richard Thompson is, um, and I you know I love Richard, and I think he's an amazing musician. I think he's made too many records that aren't quite good enough. Um, not the ones I produced, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but what he is is. It's extraordinary when you analyze what he does with the guitar, because what he does is he plays rock and roll. Rhythmically, he is a rock guitar player. And yet, he does not play any blues. There is not one blue note in his playing, ever. All there is, if you want to trace it back to roots, is Scottish bagpipes. And, you know, and and jazz, you know, but no blues, no, he doesn't have any blues cliches mixed in with his playing, and yet he plays rock and roll, and he can back up Bonnie Raitt, who's singing blues, without ever playing blues, and it's, it's extraordinary, I mean, it's completely individual take on how to be a rock and roll guitar player. But, but he can play blues, you know. Well, only he joking, to, yeah, only joking, he, he does it as a joke. Yeah. But he never does it seriously. Another. This you were. Here. Well, let's, let's got to move to Pink Floyd, of course. Huh? Okay. I got a question now. We all know. I don't. At least in my opinion, there wouldn't have been David Bowie as we know or Peter Gabriel as we know without Sid Barrett. In my opinion. Yeah. Um, we're talking about Sid Barrett here. If you didn't hear the question in the back, it's uh, Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett, and the point about David Bowie is is a very good one, and I wish that I'd thought of it or heard Bowie's quote that happened this summer. Uh, uh, this summer, Sid died. And of course, there was a lot of articles and radio programs about Sid Barrett. And there was, um, uh, Dave Gilmore was playing a series of concerts at the Albert Hall. And David Bowie came down one night and sang Arnold Lane, which is the song that is on the single. It's the only record I really produced with the Floyd. I mean, my connection with the Floyd is only at the very beginning. Um, and um, and he, Bowie was then interviewed by somebody after the show. Why was it so important for you to come down and sing Arnold Lane? And he said that that record, Arnold Lane, changed his life. And the reason it changed his life, because it was the first time he ever heard rock, rock, a rock and roll singer sing like an, somebody from Southeast England. That every other British singer tried to affect some version of American or R&B phrasing or attitude in the way that they sang. But Sid was the first person to just stand there and sing with a kind of English, working class English accent, and sing just the way he talked, and not try and Americanize or internationalize or bluesize or whatever the way that he sang. And it gave Bowie the confidence to develop his music that way, as a real English type of music, with unapologetically not trying to be anything that it wasn't. And the other thing that I discovered after I finished the book, um, which I wish I put in it, um, um, are you familiar with Arnold Lane? Does people I know, know what that record sounds like? Anyway, it's a, yeah, it's um, um, for those of you who don't, it's a story. It's a song about a uh, backyard panty sniffer <laughs> and uh, who gets arrested, you know, and. Um, what I, I talked to Nick Mason, who read the book, and we spoke afterwards. And, and he told me that Sid Barrett's Rogers family in the house, and early on in this experience, both families, and I think in one case it was just the mother, anyway, but anyway they, they discovered that girls made much nicer tenants than boys, that they were neater, and they weren't as noisy, and they were just easier to deal with. 
And so they had girls, girl students. So that meant a backyard full of lingerie on a regular basis, you know, drying on the, on the washing line. And so they both grew up with this phenomenon of going out in the backyard and seeing bras and panties on the, on the, on the washing line, and the occasional going missing of objects, you know, distressed girls saying, you know, I, there were five panties drying and now there's only four, you know, something like that. So that this was a childhood phenomenon that they grew up with, and like any good folk process, this ended up being the first hit record that uh, uh, the Pink Floyd had. And, um, and the BBC banned it, which helped to get some notoriety because they thought it was uh, indecent uh, subject matter for, um, for, for a record. Um, I'll just read a tiny, there's a little bit. Um, how that all started. It started with a, there was an organization that I was sort of peripherally involved in called the London Free School, which was a kind of weird, idealistic 60s um, underground hippie revolutionary cell of some kind that was basically just trying to help poor people in Notting Hill Gate fight the authorities and learn how to take pictures or, you know, it was sort of like educated and privileged people trying to, you know, stir things up. And the feathers of some local authorities were successfully ruffled. London Free School advice helped people challenge the criminal justice system and claim unpaid benefits. But the Free School's enduring legacy is not is Notting Hill Carnival. A Trinidadian activist, friend of Hoppy's, named Michael De Freitas, later Michael X, suggested moving an indoor celebration of Trinidadian culture onto the streets around Portobello Road during the August Bank holiday. It was colorful and subversive bringing together West Indians and freaks, the policeman's worst nightmare. <laughs> 39 years later, over a million and a half people danced through the streets of Notting Hill Gate on that same weekend. That was the first carnival. The 1966 carnival was an auspicious beginning, but it didn't raise much money. So we scheduled a series of concerts in the All Saints Hall, Powers Square. Peter Jenner and Andrew King, who were colleagues of mine in the free school, booked a group they knew from Cambridge who were looking for some London exposure. Pink Floyd had started out as a blues band, but after being asked for an experimental score by a filmmaking artist, and after Sid Barrett began his explorations of psychedelics, their music had veered off in more original directions. From the first London Free School benefit in September 1966, until their departure for an American tour in November 67, the Floyd's music was the soundtrack for the London underground scene. The film score influenced more than just their music. They liked playing in front of moving lights so much they made it a central feature of their shows. The most enduring images of the free school events, the International Times launch party, the UFO club, and the 14-hour <coughs> Technicolor dream at Alexandra Palace, are of the four Floyds bent over their instruments in concentration while purple and turquoise bubbles of light play over them. In the murky glow, it was hard to pick out personalities, but if there was a center of attention, it was Sid Barrett with his impish girl magnet looks, the screams of his slide guitar, and the offhand way he sang his oddly melodic songs. Roger Waters also stood out for me. He's extremely tall and played a very large electric bass, often with his mouth wide open. His prominent nose and big oval head were sometimes the only human features perceptible in the gloom of the light show. Roger anchored the operatic chords, giving the group a foundation like no other. When Sid and his songs were long gone, the sound that would sweep the world was their classic harmonies underpinned by Roger's bass. 
decorated by Rick Wright's artfully cheesy organ and Nick Mason's elaborate drumming and crowned by Dave Gilmore's spacey blues guitar. Sid may be the most famous individual Floyd, but his songs have been heard by only a fraction of the millions who have bought Pink Floyd records. Um, a little bit forward. Um, I talk about how I set up their deal with Polydor, I was going to be their producer, they're going to all do it for my production company, and at the last minute it all changed and the group made a deal with EMI who liked in-house producers, like people to work at their studios. And so that was it. I produced one record and they went on with another producer. I went to the launch party for the single and wistfully wished them well. My production company would have to get along without the Floyd. Arnold Lane got into the top 20 despite a BBC ban for inde indecent lyrics. Norman Smith produced The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. But John Wood and I were gratified that they had to come back to Sound Techniques to get the Arnold Lane sound for the second single. One evening in May, I ran into Sid and his girlfriend in Cambridge Circus. It is strange to recall that early on a weekday evening, there was almost no traffic in the heart of London. Sid was sprawled on the curb, his velvet trousers torn and dirty, his eyes crazed. Lindsay told me he'd been taking acid for a week. A few weeks later, Floyd fans were lined up three deep along Totten Court Road for their return to UFO. There was no artist entrance. So one by one, they squeezed between me and the crowd <coughs> for the tiny dressing room in the back. I had exchanged pleasantries with the first three when Sid emerged from the crush. His sparkling eyes had always been his most attractive feature, but that night they were vacant, as if someone had reached inside his head and turned off a switch. During their set, he hardly sang, standing motionless for long passages, arms by his side, staring into space. Dave Gilmore was added to the group soon afterwards to cover for him, and by the end of the year, Sid was gone. Another subject. <laughs> well, uh, Pardon me for not doing more research, but I did buy right. the book. Uh, did you ever cross paths with Fred Neal? I crossed paths with Fred Neal, but I didn't really get to know him. It was, um, there is a part in the book about um, when I was in England in 1964, I, um, I was taken to a pub to hear this group, and they were, I was amazed, because they were, they had, there was a rock band, and they were doing Lead Belly songs, and West Indian folk songs, and, uh, I don't know, different kinds of things I thought of as folk music, but they were doing it, they were, 1964, and they were doing it like a rock band, and it was Spencer Davis with Stevie Winwood on the vocals. And I, when I went back to New York, I hunted up Paul Rothschild, and I said, we got to form a folk rock supergroup, you know. And so we actually did try and do that. But the first night when I was out drinking and telling all these stories to Paul Rothschild, he said, it's already happening here, beginning, just beginning. And he took me to the Night Owl and Richie Havens, was singing with an electric bass player and a bongo player. And he told me that the following night, Fred Neal was going to be there again with an electric bass player and a guy playing a tambourine or something like that. It was like, it was just beginning to happen. And um, um, so, I don't know what's happened. I guess he lives happily in Coconut Grove with the royalties from Everybody's Talk. <laughs> Oh, did he? Yeah. But I think that made him pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Any other? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to ask a further question about Sandy Denny, who I, I just discovered for myself several mm -hmm. years ago, but just I think she's maybe one of the best singers that ever lived. And, mm -hmm. Except for maybe Joni Mitchell, who she used to think was better than her. You know, that, yeah. and she was just on top. And if you guys haven't listened to Sandy Denny, go get a record. But. I want to ask a question, which is, she um, did one last tour, 
and they recently put an album out from it called Gold Dust. It's pretty good. It's a live album. Yeah. And um, she did this one concert, and they just say on the record that she did this one concert, and she was supposed to go on tour, and then she died a few months later. So she did the whole tour. Do you know that? Did she do the tour, or did she only do one concert? I don't know. I just wondered. Well, if she did. A, I mean, there was a lot of. I mean, she didn't really stop working. Yeah. I went to that concert at the Royalty Theater, and I actually. I found, I think they, they, they cleaned it up and they did some repairs on the track and everything. I, I actually, when I put together a box set once, I used only one track from that album, which was her solo piano performance of The Lady. You did the green uh, box set yeah, that came out? Yeah. That's a good set. And um, uh, I don't really know, I mean, I wasn't involved. Yeah. I was just... I just was amazed with the power, like of her voice, still mm -hmm. way after Fairport, and she sounded like oh, Grace. Yeah. She could always, she could always guy, sing, you know? sing with huge, tremendous power, and um, and that was always that was originally my problem with her was when I used to see, hear her with a guitar in a folk club, and just strumming the guitar and belting out this big voice. I thought, you know, it's it's all bum, you know, it's just big, and then I heard. A, her, a recording that she did with this group called the Straubs, which was mm -hmm. actually yeah, the Strawberry Hill Boys originally, then they became the Straubs, and then later they were Rick Wait Wakeman's group and all kinds of different <coughs> mutations. Um, but hearing them with a group and recorded in a studio completely changed my perception of her. And then hearing her with Fairport, where you had a full group and Richard playing behind her, she did. She felt so relaxed with that support that she could sort of sing more subtly and gently, and not try and blast to the back row of a pub, of a pub, and overcome the clinking of glasses, you know, on her own. And so she she was able, I think, as she matured as a singer, to use the power of her voice more effectively than she had. In, there's some early records of her that are sort of available in reissues, I think. Of, or just her with a guitar, and uh, she was absolutely a great singer, and but a very, very, you know, it's, 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 I think women in the music business today have benefited so much from changed attitudes about, you know, a woman's place in the world, you know, that's happened over the years since the 60s, you know, that, that um, I knew a lot of women in the music business, performers, who had a real difficulty reconciling how to have a personal life and how to have a professional life. Like Kate Bush? Well, she was always pretty, she, she you know, she's, 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 yeah, she, well, she's not, I don't to call her tough so much, but she's pretty, Settled, I think. She's you know, now she's very happy. She has a beautiful baby and a very nice relationship. With the, he's a great guy. The hus the, the boyfriend or the husband, or whatever, and they live in a in a farm outside of London. And she works in the she has her own studio. And you know, she, Kate Bush is an example of somebody much more modern. You know, she's always gone straight ahead. You know, she's had different boyfriends, and but that hasn't deflected her single-minded achievement of what she wants to do as an artist. And Sandy didn't have the confidence for that. Sandy always knew that she was a wonderful singer and she had great confidence in her musical abilities. But she was in very insecure about her weight, about her looks, about her attractiveness, about her ability to hang on to a guy. And she distorted her career in order to keep Trevor Lucas next to her because that's the guy she decided she wanted and Trevor was notorious in London I mean, he was a huge ladies man I mean he was you know he slept with half the women in the folk scene in, 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 in London and she was terrified of going away on tour she didn't want to go away on tour unless she was in a band with Girls on the Avenue was that his what? song? Girls on the Avenue? 
I'm sorry, I heard a bad song. By father engaged. Yeah, father engaged. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I mean, he he wrote. He didn't wasn't much of a songwriter. He wrote a few songs, but he he came. I mean, he was a nice enough guy. Uh, he died a few. You know, some about ten years after she did. He was an Australian and um, a redhead. Always war. Always always a warning sign. Just, just kidding. Um, um, but he was an Australian. He had a big booming voice, and he sang Australian folk songs. And he came came to England with his, you know, played twelve string guitar and had a big voice and did really well in the folk clubs in the early years of the folk scene in England. And um, but uh, Sandy, um, you know, her her powers. Diminished. I mean, even, all of her records, uh, to me, the records that she made in the 70s, they all have two or three great tracks. But they never, she never made that record as a solo artist that everybody could say, yes, that's the one that's going to make her name. You know? um, yes? People like to grouse a lot about the terrible state of radio today and stuff. And I find there's there's still music being created that's good stuff. Or do you keep up with anything new that interests you today? Do you feel there's still people doing good work? Yeah, I think, but I do think it's tough. I think, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm I'm a little. I listen to stuff from all over the world and from all eras, and so I don't take a particular interest in what's happening today. I listen to a lot of stuff that's new mixed in with stuff that's old and stuff that's from Sri Lanka or Argentina or Japan or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and I do think that, I mean, this is a little, this is one of those statements I warned you about at the beginning, you know, that sound like they are, I, I believe this to be really true and obviously I'm sure plenty of people could poke holes in it, but The night that I spoke about with Dylan at Newport was the beginning of something, or certainly the combination of the Beatles and that was the beginning of something in which, I guess, edu reasonably well-educated middle-class kids captured something. There was a, a, a room that was open to them which involved plundering from the roots, from blues, from country music, from English music hall, from jazz from all these different things and creating this new thing you know um, that was part of the revolution that was what the revolution this was an, the musical side of the 60s revolution and the artist who walked into that room in the mid 60s had a big empty room to play in nobody had ever done stuff like this before and so there was a lot of possibilities uh, a young singer walking into that same room today, it's like walking into a crowded cocktail party. You know, every inch of floor space is, somebody's been there, somebody is there, there are ghosts, there's precedents, there's, it's very hard to carve out a really original space for yourself, I think, today in the kind of singer-songwriter mode or the rock band mode. I mean, I hear, you know, the Arctic Monkeys or Franz Ferdinand or whatever, and you know, it's fine, some of it's great, you know, it's fine, but it doesn't sound like it's really that new or different right. in a way from a lot of things that I've heard before. And the other thing that's, I think, a huge difference, and it's, this is a much more subtle or elusive concept, but I mean, I think there's a huge difference between the optimism that everybody had in, nine, in the mid-60s and the way in which people look at the future today. We were deluded in the 60s. We were incredibly optimistic. You felt as if you were right at the, you know, right, hanging 10 over the front edge of a surfboard going into this wonderful future in which the earth would provide, if we could just organize things properly, the earth would provide for everybody all over the world, you know. And uh, we were going to change, you know, we, we'd managed to s slow down the war machine, you know, and make it impossible for a government to fight a war again like that, like the Vietnam War. And we'd uh, 
turned around segregation and you know we liberated people by giving everybody drugs you know that was this was all great stuff you know <laughs> and and so you were creating music in which you were really excited about the next thing is going to be even better than the last thing and so you, that it gives you that feeling that assumption gives you a freedom that I don't think I think it's very, very difficult to come by today because obviously we now know <laughs> that none of that turned out to be true. And so everybody's people, I think, you know, the, one of the biggest differences in the atmosphere between today and 40 years ago <coughs> is that. You know, that, that everybody today, I mean, people are looking back. Everybody, you know, wants old furniture. <laughs> they want old music. They want to go to some place that's unspoiled and unchanged. Everybody is desperately trying to preserve things because we don't like the look of the future. Mm -hmm. We don't really think it's all that promising right now. And so the best that we can do for the future is to try and hang on to the good stuff from the past. That wasn't our attitude at all in the 60s. You know, we felt the future is great, you know. And we felt very connected to the past, but in a very sort of positive way. I mean, actually, there's, I mean, um, what, what's, what, what, what's our, what's the stage manager say? It's up to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, this is my... Um, sort of pretentious, grandiose, summing up a bit at the end, some of it. The atmosphere in which music flourished then had a lot to do with economics. It was a time of unprecedented prosperity. People are supposedly wealthier now, yet most feel they haven't enough money and time is at an even greater premium. The prediction that our biggest dilemma in the new millennium would be how to use the endless hours of leisure time freed up by computers has proved to be futurology's least amusing joke. In the 60s, we had surpluses of both money and time. Friends of mine lived comfortably in Greenwich Village, Harvard Square, Bayswater, Santa Monica, and on the left bank, and were, by current standards, broke. Yet they survived easily on occasional coffee house gigs or part-time work. Today, urbanites must feverishly maximize their economic potential just to maintain a small flat in Hoboken, Somerville, Hackney, Koreatown, or Belleville. The economy of the 60s cut us a lot of slack, leaving time to travel, take drugs, write songs, and rethink the universe. There was a feeling that nothing was nailed down, that an assumption held was one worth challenging. The meek regularly took on the mighty and often won, or at least drew. Debt-free students with time on their hands forced the Pentagon to stop using drafted American kids as cannon fodder and altered the political landscape of France. The tightening of fiscal screws that began with the 1973 oil crisis may not have been a conspiracy to rein in this dangerous laxness, but it certainly has worked out to the advantage of the powerful. Ever since, prices have ratcheted upwards in relation to hours worked, and the results of this squeeze can be seen everywhere. Protesters today seem like peasants outside the castle gates compared to the fiercely determined and unified crowds I joined in the 60s. Our confidence grew out of a feeling that large sections of the population and the media were with us and for what we saw as the inexorable power of our music and our convi convictions. We, in our glorious optimism, we believed that, quote, when the mode of music changes, the walls of the city shake. And we achieved a great deal before the authorities figured out how to capitalize on our self-destructiveness. Right-wing commentators still spit with anger when they contemplate how fundamentally the 60s altered society. The environmental and human rights movements and the theoretical equality of races and sexes are only the tip of a huge iceberg. Ideals that remain our source of hope for the future took root in the 60s. Part of our strength came from our sense of connection with the past. 
I remember feeling in my teens that the past was so close I could touch it. I heard my grandmother talk about Vienna at the turn of the century and play Brahms in a long forgotten style as I sat next to her on the piano bench watching her long veiny fingers. She told me that as a teenager she could rest the heel of her left hand on a pane of glass, raise her fourth finger, bring it down, and crack the glass. I could hear the sound of that violent impact in my mind, a feat of undistracted discipline almost impossible to imagine, yet as close as her mesmerizing hands. History today seems more like a postmodern collage. We are surrounded by two-dimensional representations of our heritage. Access via Amazon.com or iPod to all these box sets of old blues singers, or Nick Drake for that matter, doesn't equate with the sense of discovery and connection we experienced. The very existence of such a wealth of information creates an overload that can drown out vivid moments of revelation. Before the turn of the century, the 19th century that is, <clears throat> there was an underground craze that swept through black America. Someone came up with a catchy AAB 12 bar structure with melancholy melodic intervals which provided the perfect frame on which to hang lyrics about heartbreak, natural disasters, evil white bosses, and every other aspect of life at the end of a century that had falsely promised a road to freedom. Blues itself was an innovative craze that swept away decades, perhaps centuries, of folk traditions. We hear echoes of what disappeared in the recordings of Henry Thomas and Charlie Patton, but it is like trying to reconstruct a Cherokee city from a few arrowheads and beads unearthed at a construction site in downtown Atlanta. The destructiveness that comes with innovation is a process as old as history. Now we have the, um, the entrepreneur entrepreneurial part of the evening. <laughs> Um, I think you've got some books you can sell, which I'm very happy to sign. And I also brought with me a, some copies of this record, which comes along with the book, um, which has uh, 23 tracks that I produced in the 60s, various different artists. And uh, unfortunately, I had to buy it. I had to buy them from the local distributor, who imported them from England with the dollar and its, you know, perilous plunge against the pound. So they're twenty dollars each, I'm afraid. But um, I'll sign them anyway. Yeah. Um, and we have a, uh, a, a clipboard up front um, that if you want to leave your name and email for future events. No. no. Um, <laughs> just sign up there. Um, and if, if, you, if you want, if, if, if it's okay with you, the email addresses that you leave, I'll take a copy and put you on my mailing list. Um, do you want to...